It's now my job to take questions from the audience. We have about 20 minutes or so, um, if I'm going to keep to the timing. We have various people running around with microphones. I'm hoping I'm going to start seeing some hands shooting up Over quite there, quickly. Right um, can we take this gentleman here, please, in the second row first? Thank you. Professor Nutt, but both th thanks very much for coming out. Uh, Professor Nutt, this is a question from something in your book rather than something in your talk tonight, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm halfway through and enjoying a lot. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, relief of stress it can be a key driver for at least starting out in casual drug use, mm -hmm. uh, which struck me as very likely true, but I would say that certainly from uh, anecdotally what I know, the opposite might be just as true, certainly in this culture and at this time that uh, boredom and lack of anything better yeah, to do yeah. might be just as much of a driver, but doesn't seem to be mentioned here, but I'm only halfway through, so it might come yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder whether that chimes with any of your research at all. Yeah, the, so the, the reasons people use drugs are multiple, and if you, if you go back to the picture on page 76, you will see, <laughs> or wherever, you will, you will see, certainly stre stress relief is just one. I mean, that, there's no, you know, the, the key drug, the, the major drivers are either dealing with some kind of psychological distress or looking for some kind of pleasure. Those are the two main drivers. Some people, like, you know, De Quincey look for meaning still. Psychonauts take drugs to try to understand their brain better. But they're a rare, relatively rare, rare group. The two main drivers are pleasure and stress reduction. Um, thank you both uh, for, for, for a great great talk. Um, slightly off piece um, to Dr. Nutt. Um, I'm just wondering about Professor Nutt. I'm, I'm just wondering about um, ayahuasca. It, it seems to be very in vogue at the moment, yeah. um, and what it what it um, focuses greatly on is is the spiritual and healing properties, um, yeah. which seems to have grabbed you know a great deal of attention. Um, is yeah. there anything that you could share with us about that? Sure. So ayahuasca is a uh, co a combination of two separate plant products which together allow uh, the dimethyltryptamine, one of the plant products, to get into the brain. Dimethyltryptamine is like a sh very short-acting version of LSD. And one of the interesting things about psychedelics is that in low doses, they produce a sense of well-being, a little bit like low doses of nitrous oxide. They disinhibit the brain very rapidly and produce sometimes laughter, but also, but generally a sense of feeling better. So, so ayahuasca is used in a number of um, churches, particularly in Brazil. Uh, it's used from a very early age. Um, people start being given ayahuasca when they're three or four as a drink, as part of a, of, a, of a religious ceremony. They don't get high, they don't trip, but they in, it helps them engage in the, uh, the, the activities of the church. And it raises all sorts of interesting questions about why that would be. I mean, the, 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 we know that a lot of my research is about the targets of drugs, psychedelics in the brain. And those targets are, that target is a receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor. And the, all the psychedelics work on that receptor. And it intrigues me. That receptor has evolved as human consciousness has evolved. It's, those receptors are densely expressed in the cortex, the part of the brain where we do our thinking and feeling. But we don't know what those receptors are for. And one of the theories is that they're about bonding. They're about groups uh, having a greater harmony together. And it may be stimulating them uh, at a level that doesn't cause a psychedelic experience. It's actually beneficial to society. So there's a sort of almost, there's beginning to become a neuroscience around ayahuasca, I think. Um, yeah, can you go? This one's for Professor Nott as well. Um, you said that the alcohol industry actively promoted yeah. pictures of Leah Betts mm -hmm. when she died. Yeah. I have to say, I don't work for the alcohol industry. I'll just make that absolutely clear. I'm on the other side. But um, I'm wondering what evidence there is for that. Mm -hmm. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and would you accept that from anybody giving you that answer? Well, I, I don't know. So I will tell you, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> So was that. Which, which is why they, so they laughed. Okay. <laughs> so, well, obviously it's difficult to get that information out. But um, so the story is this: so that the uh, the PR company that put those adverts up were bidding for the Diageo contract or the pre-Diageo, whatever it's called, 
And, uh, and this was, they, they did it supposedly pro bono to protect the youth of this country against the harms of ecstasy. But they did it in the full knowledge that th if they were successful, they would get, well, it was part of their bid to get the alcohol industry contract, which they did and success successfully got and made a lot of money subsequently. So there are more details in the book. I don't remember them precisely. It, was, it proved extremely difficult to get that information out, but it wasn't me that got it, but someone else did. And I'm, it sounds utterly credible. I mean, we know that the alcohol industry spends over 100 million pounds a year persuading us that alcohol is a good thing. I mean, you know, the Health Education Council, at its best, spent 80,000 a year persuading us it was bad. So the, you know, the, the, power, the, uh, the power of the drinks industry to, to, you know, to persuade people about alcohol is overwhelming. So there, I think they said it. For Professor Nutt, um, I come from a cognitive neuroscience background, so um, I forgive me everyone if it's a bit technical, but um, the, the, the suggestion that it is quite possible to create an alcohol um, without the side effects, but, um, but also with, with an antidote. Yeah. Um, the antidote really interests me, and I actually, I remember seeing this news story um, a couple years ago, and was very fascinated by it, but for some reason didn't look into it. Um, the, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled as to how an antidote would work um, in such a scenario. Um, whereas I understand sort of how it might be possible for to have an alcohol without the side effects. Um, well, no, the antidote works because it's an antagonist, so you target receptors. So, you know, you might target, if, if you wanted, the 5-HT2A receptor with ayahuasca. You can, we've got an antidote to that. You can stop people having religious experiences by blocking the receptor. The same thing would be true of, of the intoxicant experience. Right, but wouldn't the receptors or sort of react negatively to, to being sort of bombarded by this. Well, the clever thing is you, know, you can use clever pharmacology. You use something called a partial agonist, right. which doesn't desensitize receptors. So there's, you, you can work at it with several, several tweaks to conventional pharmacology. <clears throat> yeah. This is a question for Dr. Rustin. Um, what, how long were the experiences on nitrous oxide of, of those two people? Because from the impression I got from their account, there seemed to be quite long experiences. <laughs> but from my own personal experiences. <laughs> well, while nitrous oxide is intense, it only lasts for sort of 10, 20 seconds, whereas Humphrey yeah. Davis was saying it lasted for, for a really long period of time. Am I not taking enough, or am I taking it wrong? No. <laughs> Watch out. I'm glad he asked you yeah. that question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think, I mean, are you doing the whole balloon thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. No, well, Davey actually constructed an, um, an apparatus that he would sit inside by the end. <laughs> and he would breathe, you know, we were talking, I mean, seven quarts is an awful lot. And, and it, so the experience would go on for hours. So, yeah. You need to build something that you... Yeah. Oh, I don't... Sorry, what's a quart? What's a quart? Come on. <laughs> what's a quart? It's two pints. Two it's pints. A, oh, it's two pints. No, no, two, two pints. Pint. Two, two pints. Pint. Not yeah, but it, it, it's. <laughs> I presume that was its atmospheric pressure, was it? Yes. I, mean, I guess yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, you can actually buy cylinders, by the way. We use them in. <laughs> we use them in hospitals. <laughs> they last for for a long time. <laughs> okay, there's a question up here, and then we're coming over to this one. Fas uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed at the end you were talking about reclassifying drugs, and did, was it? Did it say a, a category D? Drug? Yes, yes. So yes. What, what would Category D be? Category D was a concept that New Zealand brought in before they brought... It, sort of, it was a prelude to their current legalising, legal highs approach. And what they said was, if we're not sure if a drug's harmful, rather than let the press and the police decide, let's, let, let's put it into a Class D. That way, we will ensure that the people who sell it sell something that's pure. We will limit sales to over 18s. We will insist that the the people that sell it fund a process of collecting data on harms. And then, at some point, when we have data on use and harms, we will then know whether we, can, whether we should control it, because we will have both sides of that equation, which is an utterly rational thing to do, and that's why we should do it, because it would mean that we had evidence-based decision-making rather than media-based decision-making. So here, I mean, can you give us some examples of something that you would put, the things that you would put into Category D in this country? All, all the new all legal highs. All of them. Yeah, yeah. Much, I mean, all, except the ones that are, 
uh, peculiarly toxic, like some of the M-bombs or some of the, some of the new uh, opiate agonists, but most legal highs are relatively innocuous, and they would go into class D. Okay. And, of course, I'd move a lot of other drugs down there, like yeah. ecstasy and yeah. cannabis and BCP and things. <laughs> I, that was uh, a really good talk. I just wanted to ask, if you think with the rise of Silk Road and all of these online places where you can now buy drugs, do you think eventually, because of this tech-savvy drug user um, outsmarting the government in a way, uh, do you think the government will just think, if you can't beat them, uh, join them? <laughs> I thought the Silk Road was funded by the CIA, actually, but well, that may just be my paranoid state. I mean, it's really... <laughs> Hard to know. In theory, yes. In practice, as we've seen, it's pretty difficult to avoid being monitored by the RSA. You know, I mean, you can't. You know, there's no. There is actually no escape from the eye of the law anywhere in the world now. So, yes, in it possibly, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't certainly take the risk myself. There's a question up in the gallery. I can't see anything at all, right. so whoever it is, please yep. ask your question. <laughs> uh, thank you both for the talk. really enjoyed it. I was wondering if either of you had taken any illegal drugs. <laughs> <laughs> bound to come. And if you enjoyed them or not. That's, that's a question for you, I think, David, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah, some, but not, nothing to get excited about. Yes. <laughs> And I'm straight <laughs> <laughs> This goes on to you. <laughs> no, not my area of expertise. Can I, is that what I can say? <laughs> um, I was hoping for like a sincere answer, not a glib one. <laughs> because I think if you yeah. Yeah. Uh, mock politicians who are yeah, in a so. much yeah. more delicate situation... That's true, but I didn't mock any politicians. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. no answer. Where's David? Yeah. <laughs> So I didn't take as much as David Cameron, let's put it that way. <laughs> Nor anything as interesting as him, no. I never smoked, but I took a bit of cannabis, um, took a bit of amphetamine. Not much, really, but mostly alcohol. I think with a lot of uh, the drugs, there can be variations in potency and strength, and some things, such as cannabis, have changed over yeah. the years. Mm. People are now mm. using genetically modified crops to make mm -hmm. them stronger. Mm -hmm. And um, is that a problem, that there, there's no um, qualification of what you're taking? I mean, some, half the people buying cocaine in this country are probably getting it so cut with, you know, It is a big problem. That, the, 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 the issue of... The, so there are two separate issues. There's the issue of sort of absolute purity and, the, and, the, uh, and, and concentration of THC in cannabis, and there's the issue of the problems of sort of, of drugs being of variable um, purity. So the second one's the, more, the, the easiest one to do. I mean, variable purity is a problem if you happen to get lucky and get a clean drug, or, because then you can die, you know, because you, you're inadvertently taking more than you expect. So many opiate deaths are due to people actually getting what they wanted rather than what they normally get. So that's a bad thing. So that's why we sh all drugs, I think, if they're going to be sold, should be sold with some clear indication of what, what they are and what their concentration is. Uh, in terms of the, the, the evolution of cannabis from this 4% THC, 4% cannabidiol, as we used to be uh, used um, when it was imported from Morocco, etc., to modern hydroponic skunk, you have to think... There are two things about that. One, one is, of course, that... that, that just because something's stronger doesn't mean it's necessarily more dangerous. So, I mean, the analogy I would use is between, say, vodka and beer. So vodka is ten times stronger. Mm -hmm. So if you drink vodka by the pint, then it's going to do you a lot more harm, like it did to Quincy. Mm -hmm. But we don't. So most people know how to titrate drug intake according to the effect so most people aren't actually getting a lot more THC in their brain from skunk than they were from, from the traditional hash. The reason we have skunk is because prohibition has led to uh, a curtailment of imports. It's wiped out large numbers of farmers in Morocco, sadly, who got no income, um, and it's led people to grow stronger versions. Everywhere we have prohibi had prohibition, the net res the response is, is to make stronger version. So when we, American prohibition led to the rise of moonshine and cannabis prohibition led to the rise of skunk. Um, skunk might be more harmful because it's, in order to get a lot of 
THC in the plant, you actually breed out the ability to make the cannabidiol, which is a, possibly a natural antidote. So it's possible that skunk is more harmful, but there's, we can't be sure about that. And, uh, uh, Professor, near the end, you mentioned synthetic alcohol. Yes. I should think that's highly likely to be made with sugar, which in the last couple of days <laughs> people have been demanding should be classified as a drug. Um, however, what I wanted to ask you was, it, it, um, as an elderly person, is it really dangerous for me to have a little glass of Sauvignon almost every day <laughs> when, 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 when I'm listening to the archers so that I don't get dementia? <laughs> So the, <laughs> the answer is, is actually quite straightforward, really. So yes. it, it depends on what your definition of little is. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to buy a 125 mil glass these days, because almost all wine glasses are, are 250 or sometimes 330. But so the, yes, for you, <laughs> then I would say 125 mils once a night, no more. <laughs> the actual health benefits of alcohol have been grossly overhyped um, by the industry. The reality is, if you really want to optimise the health benefits of your glass of Sauvignon, you wouldn't drink more than 50 mils. That's the optimum. <laughs> so my suggestion is a that week. you share it with your husband. No, okay. <laughs> share it with your husband. Have half a glass each, and then you'll both feel good. Or a partner or whatever, I don't know if you've got it. Right. Uh, well, no, I can't promise that. And it's very important to say that the health benefits of alcohol only, if they're minimal, at no age, and for no, neither sex, does alcohol ha ever have any net health benefits. And the health benefits only re are only marginally demonstrable, really, in middle-aged men. <laughs> <laughs> when does middle age start and end? <laughs> well, in terms of the epidemiology, about 40, 45, and it ends um, about 60. Right, OK. Thank you. Um, we have a question here, and then we'll one, one more after that, I think. Um, I'm curious to know, if it was up to you, uh, which drugs would you keep banned and which ones would you make legal? <laughs> Me or her? Uh, David, no. So, I think it's actually, that's a very simple question. And it's a question you approach not as a scientist, or directly as a scientist, you approach it from a position of morality. A society like ours, which actively promotes the use of a drug called alcohol by taxing it, by allowing advertising, uh, by making no real attempts to reduce the damage it does. Our society, I think, is morally wrong to deny people access to drugs that are less harmful than alcohol. Just think, it's morally indefensible not to let people smoke cannabis, rather, but, if, uh, uh, but allow them to take alcohol. So what we have created, we have created a massive amount of alcohol damage because that's all people can use. Because the, the consequences of using other drugs for most people in terms of criminalization would absolutely destroy their lives as they've done that million, those million young mostly black men with cannabis convictions. So any drug that is less harmful than alcohol, I think, should be available in some kind of regulated fashion. I think that is a morally correct thing to do. Is harmful to the user? Harmful to the user, to the user, absolutely, to the user. People should have a choice. I think a significant number of you would choose, if you had a choice now, you, you, to go to a coffee shop and smoke cannabis or go to a bar and drink alcohol. Many of you would go to a coffee shop and smoke cannabis because we know that is what people do when you give them that choice, but we don't give them that choice in this country. And if you look at the scale of harms, uh, the only, there are only really three drugs which are more harmful than alcohol to the user that are commonly used. Heroin or opiates, cocaine and crystal meth. So those three, I would 
still keep controls illegal. But I think the rest should be regulated so people can make a rational choice. And that would actually reduce the damage that drugs do to society because alcohol is such a damaging drug. It would also make society a much nicer place. City centres could be returned to the general public rather than just to, to people who are binging. And, uh, and the police would like it as well because you know, they never had any problems policing people who were stoned or, or raving. <laughs> On that note... Um... <laughs> I'm going to the pub. <laughs> the myth that cannabis is sufficiently harmful that you should criminalise young people in possession of cannabis has led to an underclass of a million young people in this country with criminal records for cannabis possession.